Well, welcome everybody who's joining us today, and, uh, and, and I'm hoping that everybody is staying cool this evening. Uh, so during this pandemic, our parks have seen, you know, a great increase in usage. I know that uh, the Almaden Lake Park, uh, we had a report back, it was one of the, the number one used parks in the city of San Jose, and we're really proud of that. And uh, the council and staff realize how important our parks are uh, to, to our community and to our health in general. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm telling everybody to continue using the parks and I've been fighting for parks, uh, for ever since I've been in office and I, you know, again, I'm, I, I walk in these parks every day. And, um, uh, one thing that we have to also keep in mind, we had a huge drop off in volunteers since COVID started. We used to have a great, uh, very healthy, robust, uh, adopt a park program where we had lots and lots of volunteers come show up every weekend to help uh, Molly, Tobias, and some of our other coordinators uh, clean up our parks and fix and weed and, you know, paint and, and do all kinds of great things to, uh, to maintain our parks. We had a huge drop off in volunteers. I know that everybody's scared of COVID, but we actually have programs that, uh, that are, you know, COVID safe, you know, um, as socially distant and, and we provide materials. So if, if you are thinking about helping in the parks, please do get a hold of uh, Molly Tobias or my office. Um, we have a great, great uh, crew here, uh, including uh, yeah, lots of folks from our parks department. We also have my staff, Michelle Dexter, who handles parks. Adrian, our great volunteer today. Um, we have uh, 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 Jeffrey uh, Gomez uh, and we have, um, uh, quite a lot of folks um, on this call uh, to, um, uh, to to let you know what how we can all work together to make our parks uh, you know even healthier and more beautiful and cleaner. Uh, before you know we had before the the 2009 recession actually Guadalupe Oak Grove Park, which is the subject of the discussion today, was classified as a regional park, and there was a full time park ranger that um, that was stationed there and the ranger you know managed the vegetation kept the invasive species you know at bay and generally made uh, sure that the park was you know uh, cared for um since that depression and you know, the, the the status has gone down we haven't had um dedicate any dedicated staffing uh, <clears throat> and has relied heavily on volunteerism and when i got into office i you know wanted to work hard on volunteerism but we also worked um, with the Parks Department and we hired a consultant uh, by the name of H.T. Harvey to develop a long range ma um, vegetation management plan um, and that uh, we've been using that for the last few years. And, uh, you know, at the end of this plan, uh, we, you know, one of the goals was to create a friends of group and we're so delighted that a group of folks in our community decided to friend Guadalupe Oak Grove Park and um, and we have star one of the i think the president of the guadalupe oak grove park uh, so association on the line with us and um I, I, I hopefully you can unmute and un um and put your video on for us star are you are you there i'm here hi hi everybody good well thank you and then just to introduce yourself and how you got in, involved and 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 uh we'll go from there yeah, um, so I'm Star Taylor. I'm with the Friends of Guadalupe Oak Grove Park Group. And um, I got involved, I think it was October of 2018, when there was a, a group of goats in my, you know, in my, uh, in my park that I go to all the time. I, I live uh, very close. And um, I started planting seeds with the group and found out there was gonna be a friends group made. So uh, with Molly, and the ecology group, um, they gave us a lot of feedback as to how the, how the park was going to be maintained, how it should be maintained, how to uh, mitigate fires, uh, the goats being one of those, those projects. Um, and um, my two girls are really involved. They're eight and 11. And we go out and we check on our seedlings and, and water the seedlings. And uh, those are the sorts of things that we've done as a friends group, as well as you know, invited people just to check out the park, being that it's a really special gem in, in San Jose. Well, thank you for all the work that you do. And uh, I, I did have the pleasure of uh, working alongside you one or two times. And, um, and this is a great group of folks that I hope continues to grow uh, long after I leave office. 
Um, she mentioned the goats and you know, one of the things that we were discussing was in the vegetation management was we can, we had one or two uh, options. Uh, one of them was to actually set fire to the, a controlled fire. And a lot of people didn't like that idea. And the other one was goats. And, and the boy, the people love them. I think we had them out there at least uh, um, three times now. And uh, they've done a lot of quote unquote vegetation management. <laughs> and they, they bring a lot of smiles to people's faces. So, so that's another added plus of having the goats out there. I think they bring a sense of community. And, uh, but, but uh, you know, I, I do have some great folks uh, from the parks department. We have, uh, you know, uh, a division manager, uh, Tori O'Reilly, who is actually here as well. Um, and she's here to, to help us uh, uh, discuss what's happening and uh, Tori if you can activate your screen that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, good evening everybody. Um, hey there they are. <laughs> there's a, yeah there's the goats. There's the sheep it looks like but yeah. Um, so thank you for all being here tonight. Thank you council member Camus for having this meeting. Um, we're here because we received an, a grant from the Open Space Authority to build an outdoor learning area. And Dan Greeley and Adriel Castro, who are on this call, were instrumental in writing that grant and, and having that come through. Um, and so let me introduce um, my staff and I'll let them talk a little bit about it. So I have Jeff Gomez, who is the acting park manager in the area. Mm -hmm. And he oversees about half of the parks in the city of San Jose. And then um, Dan Greeley um, was the supervisor at Almaden, and he's actually moved up and he's in an acting role managing all of our business intelligence, but he was instrumental in all this. Um, Adriel Castro, who was his second in command, is now first in command. And none of it could happen without Molly Tobias, who is our volunteer manager. So um, welcome everybody. And I'll let you talk a little bit more about the project. Oh, you want Dan to go? Thank you, Dan. Dan. Hey everybody, my name is Dan Greeley. I'm a past supervisor for uh, Guadalupe Oak Grove and local parks in the area. And I was one of the authors of the grant for the outdoor classroom or what we're calling the outdoor classroom learning circle. Um, we are super excited that we uh, received this grant money from the Open Space Authority. And so we're, we've been doing lots of community building to really kind of make sure that we're listening to community members on um, what would, what interests them, um, kind of the placement in the park. So we've met with the friends of group and had many conversations and met them in the park. We've also met with the Martin Fontana Park. Um, association and really engage them to make sure that they know what's going on. And, and so we've done a lot of, of community building and we're kind of almost ready to do some building of the outdoor classroom or learning circle. And then we want to do just one more community meeting to make sure that the, the greater community has a chance to kind of hear about it, ask questions um, before we start building. Um, so quite excited. Some of the other outreach that we did leading up to this is we met with some of the local librarians if they were interested in kind of doing kind of some circle time or reading stories about nature in the outdoor classroom learning circle um, and some camp for um, summer camp providers if they potentially would use the space for some of their activities for for summer camps. So I don't want to take everybody's time. I just want to talk, introduce a little bit about myself and a little bit about the project. We'll go next. Hey folks, uh, my name is Adriel Castro. I'm a Acting Parks Facility Supervisor for Parks District 1 and I've had the pleasure of working with Dan uh, in getting this grant uh, uh, given to us. Uh, and uh, we're kind of in a, a planning stage now where we're starting to move on with the project. We're starting to resource materials uh, once again to kind of echo what Dan was saying. We wanted to have another community meeting to see what people's feedback was on uh, what the project, where it's going. And if people had any questions, and if uh, everybody's ready, I'd like to kind of show a slide of uh, the general air or some uh, PowerPoint presentation with some slides of the general area, as well as some slides of what it's going to kind of look like if everybody's ready. Uh, I'll share my screen if it's okay with our moderators. 
Uh, yes, yes, please. Yes, please do. And to all of our guests watching, all the attendees, um, afterwards we'll have an opportunity to join in on the conversation and ask any questions you may have. So hopefully you folks can see my screen here and uh, it's the beginning of a uh, small presentation I have here for you folks. So the first slide we're looking at here is views looking south and north. Uh, the shot on the left is looking southwest in the area and the shot on the right, uh, we're looking north towards uh, potentially kind of both the hills and the small picnic area in front of the restroom. So this is the potential site we're looking at and uh, thinking about building our uh, outdoor classroom slash learning circle. As you guys can see, it's pretty close to the roadway. So we do have uh, the small barriers here on the outside. Uh, with them being so small, we are considering uh, putting in uh, different types of barriers. Um, here we have a wider view from the actual uh, roadway looking into the area. So a shot on the left, uh, we're once again looking to kind of southwest. Uh, shot on the right, we are looking uh, north-northwest. So uh, here we have a view from the street. We see that the, the, the divider here is not really big enough to prevent people from uh, wandering out into the uh, paved asphalt road. So uh, as you guys can see, someone can kind of just hop right over it and uh, they're in the roadway. Uh, we've talked about various styles of barrier. There is some barriers that are already existing in the park facility. Uh, these barriers, uh, here on the next slide, as you can see, you can find uh, everywhere in this facility. These are just a little bit higher. They're basically the same principle. Uh, this is what we're looking at for uniformity. Once again, it's easier for us to do, easy for us to build. It keeps people out of the roadway. It serves its purpose. So uh, that's what we're looking at for a barrier as uh, safety is super important to us and one of our top priorities. Uh, this next slide here, if you guys see is, uh, our ideas for this whole circuit, circle, uh, learning circle um, area is to keep it as natural, keep the theme as, as uh, with GOG. As you guys know, GOG is a really beautiful open space with a lot of natural beauty and uh, we want to keep as close to that beauty as we can have. So uh, the sourcing of all of the materials is basically uh, just old wood, old rounds that we do have in storage over at Kelly Park. And uh, these will be finished and treated so that uh, uh, they don't have obviously any uh, kinds of ticks, jiggers, mites, any kind of diseases or anything like that. Um, as you guys can see, the natural wood is really beautiful. There's a shot on the left of kind of our, our, our stockpile. And over on the right, you can see there's a shot with my cell phone on it there. I have an iPhone uh, 7 Plus, so uh, I want to say it's like the bigger iPhone. So you guys can see they're actually pretty big rounds that we're going to be using here. Here's another shot. Pardon, here's another shot of some of the materials we're going to be using. Uh, we have uh, kind of an idea that we're going to have long seating where we lay the, the, the benches uh, laterally. And then we're going to have bench style seating for single people, which is this little kind of throne style bench you see here. As you guys can see, they're really, really big rounds. We have plenty of material to use here. Um, in this next slide, you guys are going to kind of see what our idea is for the type of seating we want for our learning area. So uh, over on the left, we have kind of a, a log campfire style uh, seating. Uh, we haven't really decided which direction we're going, but on the right, we also have a type of log full bench that is a suspended actually above the ground on two little uh, log platforms here. So we're, like I said, we're going with as natural and uh, kind of untouched by humans as we can go. And in the next slide I'm showing here, it's going to show you guys a, 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 um, a, a, our shot of the area before. And we had a, the city uh, folks give us a rendering of what our shop or our project's going to look like potentially once we've finished. And so here you folks go. Here's a slide. On the left hand side, you're going to see the area kind of how it is now in its natural beauty. And on the right, we have our rendering of kind of our, our dream diversion of what this. Uh, learning circle is going to be for us. Um, as you guys can see, uh, it's going to be uh, fairly, uh, I wouldn't say large, but uh, big enough to fit, uh, I believe it's 20 to 20 to 30 people. Um, it's, uh, 
big enough to have various kinds of functions. And um, this is basically what it will look like or what we imagine it will. Um, with that, uh, I am done and I will stop sharing my screen. All right. All right, so I believe we're now going to move into um, some more audience participation and have open dialogue and discussion on this. Um, so we have some uh, pre-submitted questions. However, if um, anyone currently in the audience has questions they'd like to say verbally themselves, um, please raise your hand or say so in the chat and we will unmute you to speak. Um, but until then, we'll start out with some of the pre-submitted questions. Uh, the first one is from Charlotte, and she wants to know how will the proposed outdoor classroom serve low income residents and will there be multilingual learning? And I want to invite uh, the staff from uh, Parks and Rec to uh, start their videos uh, to anyone who will be answering the question. Sure. I'll address that. So, um, Yes, there will be programming um, for residents of all income levels, and we will offer programming in multiple languages. Part of the work plan we're currently putting together within the Parks Division is um, to offer a, a variety of programming ourselves in addition to partnering. So we'll be offering, you know, some with the group that Adriel manages over at the lake, um, partnering with the library, partnering with um, other groups around the city to come in and do that. Um, there will occasionally be things that we charge for, but for the most part, the programming there will be free. Great. And uh, next question we have is from Amber, and she wants to know what organizations can use the space. Um, and Shirley says, may private groups make use of the educational circle to hold training sessions? Okay, I'll speak to that again. Um, so at this, pr at this time, because it's still um, in concept and it hasn't been built, we haven't thought that far ahead, but the city does have a reservation process for areas. And so, um, we can totally look into in the future having that area be reservable for you know organizations to um, rent out or groups to offer different programming either in partnership or privately great thank you um, a question from kelly asks um, what education topics are you foreseeing um, and where would they be taking place in the park Dan, do you want to speak a little bit to that? Yeah. So, um, like I said, we did a lot of outreach to libraries and community centers. And there's just some interest in doing a lot of nature-based learning and environmental stewardship and kind of working with what uh, Council Member Camus had um, secured some funding for us to put our vegetation management plan together. And a lot of the, the vegetation management plan really is doing outward outreach to community members to talk about stewardship in general. But this park has so many natural uh, amenities that are kind of gems in, in the valley that we really want to try to inspire people that live in the area or that are just naturalists to come and spend time in the park and share their knowledge. And that's where the Friends Up group we're really hoping will kind of help be the lead partner to really be outward facing and looking to form these partnerships to invite whether if it's a preschool to come out there and learn about how to plant an acorn or to do uh, an introduction to bird watching. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of animals that live in the park so we're, we're just hoping that as many different types of groups and age groups really um, take this as an opportunity to be to be good land stewards to this park. Great, thank you. Um, this next question is from Dave and um, we did already touch on the physical barriers being put in place, but 
He wants to know uh, what will be done to keep small children safe from the automobiles in the parking lot and what's um, around them on the street. I can take a stab at this, but I might need a little bit of help. So I think this is one of the, we've tried very hard to make sure if, that if we do any kind of building or installation at this park, that it looks as natural and as untouched as possible. So that's been something that we've heard from every community member is if we put up a fence is to not overbuild it because it would deter from the naturalness of the park. Um, but at the same time, we want um, a family be able to sit and listen to a lecture on nature or birding and know that your child could wander a little bit and not wander onto the street. So I think right now we're just trying to listen and we've definitely looked at other outdoor classrooms at other facilities and have shared those photos. Um, so I th we're trying to strike the right balance of safety, but also aesthetics to the park. Is, is it possible aesthetically to keep the existing, you know, low barriers and then add the uh, higher ones, uh, you know, so that it'll just, you know, <laughs> it'll be yet another one, uh, you know, because that one you can probably sneak under instead of sneak over, right? So, yeah, I think trying to use consistency in the park is key. So using similar materials, but varying heights, but just being cognizant of not going too high. So it's a real delicate balance. I'm not sure if Adriel has a little bit more information to add. Sure, if I may, um, the reality is the park has a speed limit. People should be following the speed limit at all times. Uh, we could do things to mitigate those speeds as well, such as uh, putting in speed bumps, speed barriers, more signage. Uh, I believe the speed limit inside the park is like 10 or 15 miles an hour. If you're uh, going any faster than that, um, chances are you're breaking the law. You shouldn't be driving fast in our facilities. And uh, with uh, us adding uh, not only the barrier, but uh, I think with um, some speed humps or bumps or possibly laying down uh, reflectors that can make you kind of be cognizant that you're driving in, a, in an area where there's gonna be people coming through uh, pretty readily. Um, I think that would mitigate it fairly well. Um, uh, the reality is if you're in there, uh, people go very, very slow as is. Um, I don't think I've ever seen anyone drive very fast in there. It's actually pretty hard to because of the way the parking lot is kind of set up. So I don't, I don't foresee it being a, a very big problem, but uh, we do have uh, ideas in order to mitigate if it does uh, end up becoming an issue. Um, over. Great, thank you. Um, one more um, pre-written question. Um, Susan wants to know about the timeline of development of the project. So if I can, I believe we have until next year uh, for a full completion. Uh, we're moving pretty readily on it once we do have approval from the community. Uh, we already have uh, various planning stages kind of in effect for uh, moving along, uh, not only sourcing the materials, I'm meeting with uh, one of the bench builders actually this week, later this week. So uh, we, are, we are getting ready to press on it. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, I believe we have until uh, the end of 2021 for completion? The grant requires us to finish October 2021. So we have it till next fall. All right, thank you. Um, now we have a question in the chat from Ronald. Um, and Adrian, and uh, before you um, ask that, we're going to actually bring in all of the attendees right now to participate. Um, since we have a small group and I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Um, you can ask directly to, um, to the PRNS staff. And so we're gonna start letting in um, each attendee to kind of have like a round table type of discussion. And so um, Ronald had a question. So Ronald, you'll be able to ask your question uh, right now while we bring in the rest of the attendees to the meeting. So just give us a second. <clears throat> so you can um, start your video and unmute your line if you would like to ask the question directly. Is Ronald there? 
<clears throat> okay, I guess Adrian, go ahead and, and ask the question on his behalf. Okay, will do. Um, the question from Ronald asked, what will be the maximum designed seating capacity and will it have overflow space? Uh, we touched a little bit on this a little earlier. Uh, I believe, uh, and once again, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we designed and wrote the grant out for between 25 and 30 people. So around 20 to 30 people. The area is joined on the north end by the restroom kind of picnic table area. So uh, if, if it came to it, I, I, you could probably overflow into the picnic tables. Uh, but the site alone, it, it's supposed to be kind of a standalone kind of learning site for its own purposes. Report over. Yeah, and I think in designing this and writing the grant, the site doesn't have a lot of parking. So I don't think we want to really, I don't think it's a park that you would host large events for, right? So a lot of these are going to be local events for if you brought in a lecture on birding or whatnot. So I think we want to just keep everything in scale to the park and with Park, the parking that's available. So yeah, the grant was written to have 25 to 30 people in the, in the learning circle. Okay, thank you. Um, and as Amal mentioned earlier, we want this to be like a round table. So if any of the attendees who are now panelists want to unmute themselves and ask a question or start a discussion, please feel free to do so. I'll go ahead and mention that uh, another thought about the fencing is to do the split rails like we did with the uh, native plant islands in um, uh, the Fontana Park. You know, it's uh, not exactly the same as what we have existing in um, the Guadalupe Oak Grove right now, but it, I think it would be consistent and might work out pretty well as a good balance between, you know, making it secure uh, without being overbuilt and, and natural. Thanks for the input, Dave. We're, we're actually still open to ideas as well. So I'll, I'll duly note that, sir. And, and Adrian, I'll, I'll just point out, okay, I'll just point out, you know, that I, I helped out, you know, there, there's many of us at the, the Fontana Parks Association that, that could help if necessary, you know, with that, that fence, you know, and give you some background on how we did it and, you know, it, obtain the materials and such uh, in, in Fontana. And it's always a good Eagle Scout project. So if we decide to go that way, you know, we can maybe find a local youth who could get um, involved with it too. Yeah, we had a lot of good projects uh, in the Guadalupe Oak Grove Park already with the, uh, some Eagle Scout projects already. Does anyone joining us have any additional questions for the staff or for the council member? Or for start from Friends of Guadalupe? Okay. Yeah, if, you have any, if you have any questions about what to do in the park, what's in the park, maybe you haven't been, um, feel free to ask. We'd love to share with you our day to day. or how to get involved. You know, we have a Facebook group, the Friends of Guadalupe Oak Grove Park. Um, if you go to that site, you can find our email. Uh, you can, there are days in which Molly or I will set up a volunteer day. Uh, now with COVID, we have about 10 volunteers. So if you wanted to volunteer, we'll have uh, acorn planting soon. Uh, as, as the rains come, we'll be collecting flower seeds from inside the park, uh, distributing it in, in certain areas so that, um, residents and guests can enjoy the, the natural wildlife and the wildflowers of the area, specifically in uh, Guadalupe Grove Park. Um, check out what we're gonna be doing in the next months to come. Um, feel free to, to volunteer or, or just find us as we're wearing our volunteer vests. Um, come say hi. 
uh, come check out the reader board, see if there's anything going on, um, or just take a stroll with your dog, because I know that there's the dog park right next to us as well, and, and the, um, the tot lot for the kids. Once we can start using those things, uh, the dog park you can use, but I think the tot lot you can sort of walk around. It has great lighting. There's some great paths. So regardless, uh, find a way to, to come and enjoy yourself at the park. When will like uh, some volunteer opportunities be like opening up? Like, is it going to be anytime soon? We do have uh, a couple acorn plantings uh, prepared for hopefully as soon as the rains come because uh, we want to line it up with the seasons. Um, that will start picking up more in October and November as, as we've been collecting seeds from inside the park. Right now is acorn season where uh, we're going around and picking the, the native endemic uh, acorns from the trees that are in the park and, and we're starting to store them in our refrigerators so that we're preparing them for, for seeding. Uh, so that, that process is a really fun process. Uh, the other things that we like to put out there is the goats and the sheep that we we'd like to do that twice a year, mitigate uh, the growth uh, in the in the late fall and then in the early spring. So even if it's not volunteering, contributing to those those events financially are really helpful. They're enjoyable, you know, to us as the neighbors as well. So uh, we'll put flyers on our reader boards in the park if you happen to be in the park. You can check out the Facebook page as well, and feel free to shoot us an email just saying, hey, I'd like to help, you know, uh, what, what can I do? And we would be happy to get back to you on that. All right, uh, thank you. And, and perhaps I can add that, um, I think we, we could have uh, some more work parties uh, to do vegetation management, uh, basically uh, pruning and, um, you know, clearing of, of, of areas that are fire hazards. Um, so, uh, you know, if you have some com community, high school community service hours that you need to do, uh, we can probably accommodate you if you, if you contact us, um, you know, and maybe just let us know what kind of things you're interested in and, and, and we may be able to find, uh, activities out there in the park for you to do. Why don't you guys, uh, Molly just put her email address on there. Maybe you guys can post uh, on the chat. Um, it's the chat so that everybody can have um, where to uh, log into for volunteer opportunities and the website. Will do. Thanks, Johnny. I'd like to also just throw out there that if any of you are photographers or would like to, you know, take pictures of the park, because sometimes people see really special things and most of us have our cameras now with, you know, our phones. And so the Facebook page is a great place to share those photos. So if you um, take a picture of something fun and you're willing to share it with the community, please let us know because we'd love to keep, you know, the Facebook page filled with lots of fun pictures of the park. And can you let us know what that Facebook page is? Is there a specific? It, it is called it? Friends of Guadalupe Oak Grove Park. So if, if you were to type that in to Facebook, you'd find it. Um, as well as, and, and on that site should be our, our email if you wanted to contact us as well, which I think, I don't want to, we, we're just, we're still new with the email. So go to the Facebook page and, and our information should be there. And I, I don't want to give any, any incorrect information, but I'll type it in here. And if anybody has any high resolution pictures, I'd love to have it as my background. We have received hand over the, uh, the the picture that Tori is using of the sheep. <laughs> I took that one. <laughs> I was going to say you can always visit the Facebook page for great pictures to use as backgrounds. Thank you, Dave. It's gotten many compliments over the last six months. I did take some and of my own, but they weren't high resolution. They came out blurry. And with that, you know, um, there's a even on our friends page is video that we have we have secret cameras to find and, and and look at the activity the wildlife activity that's happening and we'll post those as well so we've had we have coyote and bobcat and obviously the, the more common birds and squirrels um i'm hoping maybe one day we'll you know get some more more activity and more interesting things 
Um, but we're always, we're always interested because of how natural it is. Uh, we want to keep it that way. So if we know the animals are coming, then we're, we're, hope, we're hoping that that's what's, you know, our job is, we're doing our job well. Uh, and I, I noticed uh, Ronald uh, was on here, Ron, Ron Horry. Uh, he's an excellent photographer and takes some high resolution photos. Maybe uh, we can interest Ron in, in, in taking a walk through the Oak Grove and, and getting some photos for us. I don't know if he's still on here or not. He says, I have a video of the sheep. I have lots of pictures. <laughs> so I guess. He's interested. <laughs> yeah, if you have something that, you know, I've taken a number of photos that are just of the paths and the heritage, the oaks that are there that have been there for hundreds of years. Uh, there's, I don't know of too many other places in San Jose that have these trees with such beautiful scenery, uh, with so much of nature around where you don't, you don't ha see the roads, you don't see um, a lot of, the housing even because of the way it's designed and uh, the way it's been maintained over the years. And so those are the so sorts, of, sorts of things that we're also hoping to, to um, keep well in the park, uh, considering what, what the natives had, had treated it as sort of a, as a historical pointer or marker as well. And besides acorns, you guys are collecting wildflower seeds, right? And trying to re repropagate all the wildflowers that used to be in there? Yeah, it's been, um, it's an effort um, mainly by a few other volunteers, but over the months, you know, as the seed, as the flowers flower, as the seeds come, you know, we'll, we'll be checking around the park. Now, there, there hasn't been a lot because of the, the there were, there was a lot of uh, grazing by, by cattle for many years. Um, so we want to help that along and we have been collecting as we see things and try and, try and find, you know, in little tucked in areas where there might be just a little bit that we can hold until the, until this, the rain, fall rains come and um, see what happens. And back to the conversation about back, background pictures. Uh, we had Shirley who was there in the middle and she says, my background pic is one I took when up on the hill watering, including a bird house hanging from the tree. So. Thank you, Shirley, for sharing that. You can also always unmute your line and share your comments directly if you would like. Are there any more questions? Would you like to unmute your line, Shirley? Or uh, did you wanna say something? Yeah, it was my first time to water. And um, so I actually carried a bucket up to the top of the hill that nobody was really at and watered, watered a couple of few trees. And then I was really watching my step coming back down because I didn't realize there's so many like bolted out rocks and stones and everything. So I was really watching my step, but I stopped to kind of look over the view and then that birdhouse popped up right in front of me. So I just had to take a photo. Um, it was a great experience. It was warm that day. so. You know, yeah, it was, it, so I encourage anybody, um, they have different w ways you can water if you're, if you're not able to carry the buckets, and so. That's why we love having the, the students come, you know, they actually want to like see how far they can take it. So uh, we do have some hills that are, that are uh, some work uh, that, that we want to, propagate more of these these um, oaks on. Um, so we're, we would love to have emails from anybody who want to vote, whether it be individuals or groups of kids. That's That would be wonderful. And um, if you look in the chat, um, Tori mentioned that if anyone has any ideas for programming you want to see at the parks, then please speak up and um, um, go ahead and say some ideas. Um, you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Oh, and Ronald wrote in the chat that there are some Native American grinding rocks in the park and um, there could be programs on their history. Uh, I, I think we could do that. I, I, I've, 
see a lots of opportunities for bringing in speakers uh, to talk about the natural history of the park or the natural history uh, of California. Um, you know, I know uh, Val Lopez, who is the, um, the, the tribal chair of the Amamutsen that uh, historically live just a little south of the, of, of the Oak Grove. And um, he likes to speak. And, um, you know, I've, I know other, you know, programs uh, through the Santa Clara Valley uh, Open Space District um, where, uh, you know, there's all kinds of educational opportunities. And I think it will be a lovely little spot to, to have, uh, you know, presentations, particularly on the natural history. And um, we could have native speaker come in I kind of have a question for everyone that's like involved with the park. What are your, what is your favorite aspect of Guadalupe Oak Park? Cause I've never been and I kind of wanted to hear. Good question. Um, you know, people are mentioning the hillsides. People are mentioning the canopies, the large trees. Um, you could probably walk the park within 30 to 45 minutes casually. And if you're at the top of the highest hill, you can get a 360 view of the entire city, uh, you know, which what's in, in view. Um, it's a it's a really good spot. If, if you take the paths that are low, you can you're going to be under these huge oaks that canopy you in in shadow. Um, it is a, it's one of those parks in which you can stroll and you'll feel a part of the nature uh, really easily. Um, those are just a couple of the things. It also has a washroom that helps if you have children, which I do. Uh, it also, there's somebody who maintains, uh, you can, you know, being that you can bring your dogs, you can, you know, wa have water. There's a, usually a water fountain if that's being used or not used during COVID. But traditionally, you know, your, your dogs will even be accommodated if you needed it. You know, there's a couple benches already. There's a lot of uh, different benches even down the paths if you wanted to sit and just chat, right? Um, that, that all being COVID related and not, but um, just taking a stroll, just, if you were to take, you know, an hour of your time just to take a walk, you'll find that a lot of spots are very scenic in, in, different, in different ways. Yeah, it's one of those places that uh, you never know what you're gonna encounter. You may see a snake or a tarantula or, um, you know, just uh, meet a friend or whatever. But um, to me, what's really special about it is despite it just being a, a tiny little park, there are a lot of uh, viewpoints where, you know, if everywhere you look, all you're seeing is nature. All you're seeing is the oak trees and stuff. And you can really imagine, um, you know, what it's like going back in time, you know, what, what the Santa Clara Valley looked like before we built most of it out. It's really a remnant. Uh, it, it has, you know, some hills, but it also has a, a valley floor area where, um, you know, you look through across the valley floor and you just see the oak trees and, you know, little meadows. Uh, and, um, you know, that's, that's an experience that you, you can't find anywhere else. <laughs> you know, because most of Santa Clara Valley has, has been developed. Uh, yeah, it's we, just we, easy to find that little piece, uh, you know, uh, where you're, uh, you know, alone with your thoughts, if you want to be, you know, and, and just, uh, you know, feel that connection to na nature without a lot of effort, you know, and it does have the facilities there, but they're consolidated. It, it's not dominated by human interjections, you know. Uh, we have a few more questions that have come in uh, through the chat. Adrian, you want to take it over? Yes. So, so um, there is a Question from Jean. Uh, Jean, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? If not, I can read it, but if you'd like to unmute, that'd be great. Um, uh, the
question was what kinds of things could you talk about in an education thing? And I just started asking a million questions that I've always wondered. Um, so there's sandstone there and, and people always talk about it when they go by it. They go, oh, look, look at what's here. And I know there's grinding rock up there too. Um, but was it ever used by the owners as a quarry? Was, was it quarry? Was there more at one time? I don't know what's in the condos on the other side of the fence. Is that just a big rock? A lot of people have made comments that are older than I am about what that used to look like. And I've always wondered what it used to look like. Um, I also wondered how do you quarry stone, especially if it's like the 1880s and how do you build? And once I heard someone say, say they have interlocking grooves and that's how you fit them together. Is that true? I don't know. So Greystone is not very far away, the historic site. We've got the same or similar rock sitting right there in the park. Um, it might be the place to do that interpretation because the historic site for Greystone where the marker is, is not really a very good site to do that work. And the nearby park is not a very nice park for doing those kinds of things either um, because there's no quarry over there just a playground and kind of barren too. Anyway, so I had that and then I asked a bunch of other questions and then other ones. I asked about the Athenors and, and asked why did this group of oak trees survive? Why, it's part of it's flat. Why didn't they just, you know, chop them all down and use them for firewood like everywhere else? Um, and um, how did that happen? Who owned it before the Athenors? Or did the Athenors own it from like the 1850s forward and it was something like next to their major house and they loved it for some special reason? We may not know, but maybe somebody does. There's a bunch of Amadin um, aficionados and maybe somebody knows. Um, and then there's some stories about the uh, development that was adjacent to it uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, and uh, when they took their uh, backhoes through to get it all ready and flattened all the parcels, um, they discovered a lot of Native American remains. And so there are a lot of kind of gruesome stories about that. But I'm wondering, you know, what does that mean for the importance of this particular site in the, for Native Americans? Is that one of the reasons the oak trees survived? Um, because it had greater meaning. Um, you know, uh, was there a village there or nearby? I only have fragments of stuff that I can't prove because I don't have access to the uh, uh, materials up at the Santa Rosa Depository because you have to be a certified archaeologist to have access to that. So I'd be interested in hearing a talk that told me. And so those were some of the ideas of things I want to know. So this, this meeting is being recorded. Can somebody from the Council District 10 staff uh, maybe let us know what all those questions are in the chat? Because I've been trying to screenshot things and write things down. And Jean, I have to admit, you kind of threw me with um, your question after question after question, but they're really good questions. Yeah, and, and I can answer a few of those questions. And I know Jean can answer a few of those questions herself. And maybe we should get together and 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 work on that ourselves, uh, or at least see if we can track down some people that can answer some more of those questions. Well, uh, but I love the idea. I love presentation. The yeah, some sort of presentation on the the history of the you know the, the, from the native time to the 1800s, so different. Oh, absolutely. And there's all kinds of little interesting tidbits. I know that they started building um, Stanford with the stone out of out of there. Uh, of course, it didn't work so good. It, it turned out not to be a great building material. It kind of cracked. It wasn't strong. And they built the rest of the Stanford with, from somewhere else. Uh, but there's all kinds of little tidbits like that. You know, the Guadalupe or the Los Alamitos Creek Trail, you know, that used to be a rail, a rail line to haul the materials out. And, um, you know, there's a lot of tidbits there that, uh, you know, we really... Uh, could do uh, uh, good by uh, doing some more digging and, and organizing. And I, I just think there's lots of top, 
topics there that the Jean has touched on that uh, I think would be great for little educational talks. Yeah, I, I mean, I have tidbits and I, I'll be honest, I know a little bit more than what I've alluded to, but I don't have enough to turn it into a narrative. There are too many missing gaps. And so um, then, then at that point it's, well, what are the answers to those questions? I still have no idea why this stand of oaks survived. What was it about the chain of property ownership? It sh they shouldn't have survived given the behavior of all the rest of Amadin Valley and the pressure for oak to um, hold open tunnels up in Amadin Quicksilver Park yes. and to uh, feed the trains that ran up and down the Amadin Valley to collect stone from the quarries. There is no reason those trees should have survived. Why did they? Who protected them? How did that happen? You know, that, that, I'd sure like to hear somebody's opinion on that, and I have no idea the answer to that question. And it's, it's pivotal. It is the essence of this park. Here we are, you know, in 2020, trying to save, rescue, restore, steward this park because it's so special. But that's been true for over 150 years. Well, who preceded us? How did they protect it? Why? Why didn't they just, you know, use it to build their houses? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. And uh, the short answer to Tori's question is, <clears throat> yes, we can um, send all these questions over to you to your office and the recording will also be available. Um, and we can pull out questions from the discussion as well. Uh, Adrian, do you wanna read Ronald's uh, comments? I apologize, I'm having uh, some allergies here, so I'll pass it back to Adrian. Ronald had some comments in response to Jean's questions. Yes, absolutely. So um, <clears throat> Ronald mentioned that there are three types of oaks um, in the park and um, it'd be interesting to learn about the differences in the historic populations and uses of those oak trees. He also said that the Open Space Authority owns the Greystone Quarries now, and they may be interested in partnering to do a presentation at Guadalupe Oak Grove Park on sandstone quarries. And I see Jean just uh, added something new in the chat, um, if she wanted to um, talk about that and unmute herself. Um, I had already said this comment um, because I thought I had already sent it, but as it turned out, I had not hit return yet. So there it is. <laughs> All right. And do we have any other comments, uh, questions from anyone at the round table? Uh, I'll just mention that uh, we have uh, partnered up already with the Open Space Authority on at least one presentation that I did with them uh, virtually. Uh, and we could do a lot more. And, and I, I think there is a great opportunity here with a lot of um, uh, you know, cross-pollination on, on these issues. Um, I'll say quickly on the trees, it is really unique to have um, all of you know, such a, a, a large population of blue oaks on the valley floor land. Uh, and, and it is, has been kind of an interesting question that has been on my mind. And I know like Pat Pizzo, uh, who was instrumental in getting things moving with the Friends of the Guadalupe Oak Grove. Um, and in fact, you know, I was out there and Star was out there with me, I think uh, with her kids, uh, but perhaps uh, at any rate, um, when um, a woman up from San Luis Obispo, who happened to be Chumash, uh, came for a, um, a gathering of a lot of tribes from around California at the county fairgrounds, and she was out there uh, looking for um, blue, blue oak acorns because she wanted to make a certain bread that was best with the, the blue oaks. Um, and so I thought, <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting. And she also was looking for the best producers uh, to, to pray with, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, I think these are interesting questions. And I, 
I look forward to learning more about it myself. Thanks. And um, Susan um, suggested that we partner with CNPS for programs on California native plants, and that could also be quite valuable. Um, but we are approaching 730, so I wanted to um, turn it to Tori to make some closing remarks for us before we end. Sure. Um, it's really cool to see so many people excited about this park. We've been involved with um, the vegetation management plan over the last couple of years and you know working with star and dave and shirley and lee and i know i'm missing people um in the friends group and we've done some really cool things and um you know i, I was thinking as we were having this discussion you know the city of san jose parks and rec um just recently you know created our 20-year strategic plan and the guiding principles in the strategic plan are stewardship, equity, access, public life, identity, and nature. And the really cool thing about Guadalupe Oak Grove Park is we can implement every single one of those guiding principles in this park. And I think this nature learning circle, you know, that Dan and Adriel and team work so hard on, you know, getting the funding for is, is gonna be instrumental. You know, so I'm looking forward to it. And I'm, it's exciting. Anyone else from my team have anything to say? And we will post updates as we know more at the reader board out there. Yes, um, we'll have, we have some things up there already. We have ways in which um, you can visit the sites. Um, you can um, find out what we're going to be doing. So check the reader boards, check Facebook and um, send us an email, give us information. Maybe you found some history, maybe you found some books. Uh, we'd love to stay connected with, with what's happening. We wanna answer those questions uh, that, that Jean brought up and maybe find a publisher. <laughs> it sounds like there's a big book there, <laughs> but, but it would be fun to, to get the community involved in, in knowing the history. There are many of us that, have, that are newer to the area like myself um, but if there's anybody out there that, that has been around for a long time and seen the development, heard, heard stories, um, we would love to hear about that because there, there are some questions that we don't have answered yet. Well, I wanted to thank everybody for coming again, especially uh, Varun. You don't, you don't often get uh, young people uh, to attend uh, these meetings, on, you know, and I really appreciate the young people being involved in yeah. this park and, and of course all the dedicated volunteers you know like David and Lee who have been there a lot longer than I have and and for their their guidance uh, for me as well I want to thank our park staff uh, for for all their efforts my only comment is I'd like to see the benches before the before the barriers so uh, if we could uh, start with the benches before the barriers that would be you know I think uh, the, the the higher priority and uh, I look forward to seeing this park being used in all this, uh, in all the activities. And I know that we can come up with a lot more activities. So thank you all for, for everything. Thank you.